Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue thinking about earth materials. So in this video we're going to be thinking about how certain minerals are distributed throughout the earth. Now this is going to correspond to section 4.10 of your textbook. So if we look at this diagram here we can see that we have essentially a slice through the earth. At the top of course we have the crust which consists of the continental and oceanic crust, Underneath that we have the mantle, and underneath the mantle is of course the core. Now each of these layers has its own distinct chemistry, and because these layers have their own distinct chemistry that's going to produce a distinctive mineral assemblage based on that chemistry. So if we have a rock that's you know full of iron, that's obviously going to produce lots of iron minerals. So the distinctive chemistry of each of these layers is going to produce a mineral assemblage which is associated with that particular zone. So the first, the first area we're going to think of is the continental crust. Now if we look at this rock here, this is a piece of granite, which is by far and away the most common rock in the continental crust environment. And what we can see is this particular rock is dominated by very light coloured minerals. Now we've discussed how silicate minerals are by far and away the most important class of minerals out there. They make up approximately 90% of all minerals. Now the continental crust is going to be dominated by silicate minerals and in terms of the rock's chemistry we have obviously lots of silicate so we have lots of silicon but we also have abundant sodium, potassium and aluminium. So this means that the continental crust is going to be dominated by sodium aluminium silicate minerals and potassium aluminium silicate minerals. These minerals are going to be non-ferromagnesian and so that means they're going to have a light colour. And obviously that helps to explain why the granite that we can see here is quite, uh, you know, quite a light grey in tone. Now there are, you know, there's obviously going to be some iron in our rock as well. And the iron and magnesium that's present is forming these darker crystals, which are probably the mineral biotite. But as you can see, they make up a rather minor proportion of the total rock. So continental crust in general is going to be dominated by sodium, potassium, silicon and aluminium with lesser amounts of other elements like calcium, iron and magnesium. Now the oceanic crust is different. Notice the difference in colour between both of these samples. The oceanic crust is a lot darker. So straight away we can think to ourselves, right, the fact it has this darker colour would suggest that what we're looking at here is a rock which is rich in ferromagnesian minerals. And so we should expect the minerals that make up our oceanic crust to probably be quite rich in elements like calcium, iron and magnesium and that's exactly what we see. So if we take a piece of oceanic crust and we analyse it in the lab we see that it's dominated by calcium silicate minerals in particular and a smaller proportion of the rock are going to be iron silicate minerals or magnesium silicate minerals. Now underneath the crust of course we have the mantle. Once again we can see that this particular rock has quite a, a strong green colour to it and so this once again is going to you know, suggest that we are looking at a ferromagnesian group of minerals so we can expect that there's probably going to be quite a lot of magnesium, iron and maybe a little bit of calcium in this particular sample. Now I should point out by the way that this sample is actually a sample from a volcano which so it formed on the surface of the earth but these chunks of rock which we can see here, the green chunks, are things which are called xenoliths. So what's happened is, is the magma was moving towards the surface, it uh, managed to pull some pieces of mantle rock into the magma as it rose through the mantle and into the crust and then was eventually erupted onto the earth's surface. So all of this lighter grey material here, we're not interested in that. We're focusing on these uh, xenoliths which we can see here which are marked out by these green rocks. Now as I said the colour suggests we're looking at ferromagnesium minerals and that's backed up by the chemistry because we know that mantle rocks are dominated by magnesium silicate minerals and iron silicate minerals. Underneath all that of course we have the core and we know that when we make it to the core we stop having silicate minerals. Instead the core is dominated by iron nickel alloy. Now in terms of samples of core material, we don't actually have any samples of core material because we can't drill down far enough, it would be impossible to get it. 
However, we do have samples of core material from planets that were destroyed in the early history of the solar system. So this particular uh, sample we can see here is what's called an iron meteorite. And as you can see, it's made up of uh, this metallic iron nickel alloy. Uh, it has a very distinctive uh, pattern on it, which is called Widmanstatten texture. And this is very, very commonly seen in iron meteorites. And so this represents a, a sample of a core of another planet that got destroyed early in the Earth's history. But nevertheless, it gives us an idea of what our own core is made from. So one of the questions you need to ask yourself is, OK, well, obviously the chemistry is controlling what minerals we're seeing in these rocks. But is there anything else that's controlling it? Well, the answer is yes, pressure and temperature. So in the case of the continental and oceanic crust, the pressure is going to be relatively similar. What is going to be different, though, is the temperature. Typically, rocks like granite will form at a lower temperature than rocks like uh, than rocks like the oceanic crust. So oceanic crust rocks will have to have minerals in them which are stable at higher temperatures. And it just so happens that minerals which are rich in calcium, iron and magnesium tend to be more stable at higher temperatures when compared to silicate minerals which are rich in sodium, potassium and aluminum. Now, in the case of mantle rocks, as we go down into the earth, of course, we know the temperature and pressure is getting a lot higher. Um, it turns out that iron magnesium minerals, particularly the minerals olivine and pyroxene, are very stable at the higher pressures and temperatures that we find in the mantle. So that's also going to encourage the formation of these iron magnesium minerals because they are stable in that environment. So the distribution of minerals in the earth is controlled by both chemistry, pressure and temperature. So let's have a think about the chemical makeup of the Earth. So if we look at the Earth's crust, what do we see? Well, we can see by far and away that oxygen is the most abundant element. And this isn't a big surprise. We know that oxygen is going to be present in silicate minerals, and they're going to make up the vast majority of minerals which make up the crust. So we, you know, we should expect a large amount of oxygen. But the oxygen is also going to be there in the form of water. There are lots of minerals that contain small amounts of water in them. And so this oxygen is also going to reflect the presence of that water within the crystal structure. That also explains why there is also hydrogen. Because once again, of course, water is H2O. So when we have water in our mineral, we're not only going to have oxygen, but we're also going to have a small amount of hydrogen in there as well. Now, as we've also, as we've already touched on, um, in terms of the uh, crust itself, obviously it's dominated by silicate minerals, so that's going to explain why we have so much silicon. And of course, most of those silicate minerals are going to be aluminium silicate minerals, so we can also expect quite a lot of aluminium as well. Now, in the case of the elements that we see over here, sodium, magnesium and potassium, they're going to be dominantly found in the silicate minerals that make up continental crust, whereas calcium and iron are going to be mostly found in minerals that make up oceanic crust. Um, we also see small amounts of titanium, sulfur and chlorine, and these are going to be in the form of accessory minerals. So in the case of titanium, there's a whole range of titanium oxide minerals that will turn up in very low quantities quite regularly. Lots of sulfur bearing, so sulfide minerals will turn up in very low quantities in both continental and oceanic crust. And we'll also, of course, get the presence of some halide minerals in these areas as well. And so that helps to explain why titanium, sulfur and chlorine are also present in relatively low concentrations. So when it, when it really comes down to it, the continental crust is dominated by oxygen, followed by sulfur, followed by aluminium. And then, of course, the rest of these metals here uh, are metals which are commonly bonded to the silicates. Now, let's look at the average abundance for the Earth as a whole. So you'll notice all of a sudden we've had quite a significant change in the chemistry that we're looking at here. Now, once again, oxygen, as we can see, is very, very important. So it's still extremely abundant. However, there is also a lot of iron all of a sudden. Now, the reason for this is when you look at the Earth as a whole, all of a sudden we can include the Earth's core. And the Earth's core is pretty much nothing but iron nickel alloy. 
So all of a sudden, as soon as you include the Earth's core in your calculation of you know the, the abundance of elements in the whole Earth, well, then all of a sudden the amount of iron goes shooting up. Same goes for the nickel as well, because obviously, once again, that's you know within the Earth's core mostly. Now, you'll also notice that the amount of silicon is still high, and this is, represents silicon that's both contained within the continental and oceanic crust in the form of silicate minerals, but it also includes silicon that's contained within mantle rocks, also in the form of silicate minerals. And it just so happens that most mantle rocks are dominated by magnesium and iron silicates. And of course, the mantle is the thickest layer of the Earth's interior. So it's unsurprising that magnesium is also quite an important element because that's going to be occurring in the mantle in quite large quantities. Now, uh, on this diagram as well, you will also notice that sulfur has increased in abundance. And this is because sulfur is quite common in the Earth's core. You will notice over here, though, that the amount of hydrogen, sodium, potassium, calcium have dropped off to very low concentrations on the whole. And that's because they're not actually present in the Earth in the same concentrations as the other elements that we can see here. The thing is, is that they are concentrated in the continental crust, especially in quite large amounts. And so we tend to think of them as quite common elements because they are you know, visible to us on a regular basis. However, when you look at the Earth as a whole, the concentration of elements like sodium, potassium and calcium is actually relatively low. Finally, when we compare the abundance of elements in the Earth versus the abundance of elements in the universe, we can see that there is quite a substantial difference. So if we look at the distribution of elements for the universe, we can see that it is dominated by hydrogen. And this makes sense. Hydrogen is the simplest of all the elements to form. So during the Big Bang, there was a process called nuclear synthesis that went on, which formed the earliest and lightest element. So you know, nuclear synthesis produced really reasonably large quantities quantities of hydrogen, helium, and also a little bit of lithium. So those three elements were produced by the Big Bang. And of course, hydrogen being the easiest one to form was produced in, largest quanti in the largest quantity, followed by helium, and then finally followed by lithium, which is, was produced in very, very small amounts. Now, you can also see that within the universe, we also have noticeable concentrations of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now, these are related to stars. So within the core of stars, we have obviously very high temperatures, very high pressures. Uh, and of course, that brings about the process of uh, nuclear fusion, which is when we take elements like hydrogen and due to pressure and temperature, they can be forced together until they end up fusing to form new elements. And so the production of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen within stars helps to account for their abundance. And if you give the universe enough time, you're going to steadily see the amount of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen going up, and the amount of hydrogen will steadily be going down because it will be being steadily used up in stars to make heavier elements. Now, you will notice that lots of the elements that were present within the Earth, so elements like iron, magnesium, silicon, and aluminium, are essentially relatively minor components of the universe as a whole. So you're probably thinking to yourself, how did the Earth end up with so much of them? Well, to answer that question, we need to think about the early solar system. So if you imagine in the early solar system, we have our, our, our juvenile sun in the middle, and around our juvenile sun, we have a disk, which consists of a mixture of gases and dust. Now, when you're relatively close to the sun, obviously temperatures are going to start getting higher. So the heat from the juvenile sun is actually going to be boiling off the gases in the region which is closest to our juvenile sun. This is the region we now refer to as the inner solar system. So this is the area that includes Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. So that area was being heated up by the juvenile sun and that was causing the gases in that area to boil away. So that meant the hydrogen and the helium in that area got lost, got pushed out, it was gone. Now, this means that the inner solar system therefore became rich in other 
elements and other minerals which could survive the higher temperatures. And of course, some of those minerals were things like iron and nickel alloys. You also had certain minerals which are called CAIs, which means calcium aluminium inclusion. So very, you know, calcium and aluminium rich minerals. But you also had one group of minerals as another group of minerals, which of course was the silicate minerals. And all of these phases which, which can survive these higher temperatures are referred to as refractory phases. And so when the gas uh, got pushed out of the inner solar system, it meant the inner solar system was essentially a area of concentrated refractory phases. And so these phases would eventually start to coalesce together and they would form the inner planets. That's Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Now, the thing is, is these refractory phases were present in very low abundances in the, uh, in, the, in the disk of gas and dust that surrounded the Earth. And so this means that, you know, compared to the, the total volume of material in the disk, there wasn't actually that much of them. And so these, that, that means that the planets that went and formed from these refractory minerals in the inner solar system are quite small. In contrast, as you move out into the outer solar system, where we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, well, in that area, you had lots of gas. So when those planets started getting big enough, they started to uh, have sufficient gravity to trap and hold the gas that was in that area. And so they started to grow very, very quickly because there was essentially plenty of food for them to eat. So they grew larger and larger and larger, which is why the outer planets are very, very big. And the inner planets in comparison are quite small because there was simply less material to form the inner planet so they couldn't grow to a large size. So this difference in how certain materials were distributed in the uh, early solar system helps to explain the variation that we see um, in the Earth's chemistry versus the universe as a whole. Okay, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.